Thank you for being here, Mr. Roland Roberts. Uh, I'm glad that you agreed to speak with me. Uh, and how long did it take you? Where did you come from? Flew in from Orlando, Florida. And uh, so I had a direct flight in, and then I'll be flying out later today because my wife is started having contractions two days ago with our first son. So I uh, don't want to be gone too long from, from her. <laughs> and talking about your wife, how is she doing? Oh, wonderful. Uh, obviously, she has only passed out basically one time in her adult life, and it was during my announcement for president. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that, that must have been scary because I saw you, uh, that was in January. Yes, January 20th. And, and so you are there, you are trying to announce your presidential bid. She's there on your right side, and she begins to fall. Right. And how, how, did you, how did you feel? She was actually behind me, about uh, eight, eight feet at least behind me. And then, uh, of course, there was a lot of movement behind me the whole time, uh, state troopers and others walking around the Capitol. And, uh, and so from my perspective, uh, you know, there was all kinds of noise. But whenever I saw some people on my side start to move out of my peripheral, uh, I did start to look back just to see if there was actually an issue um and then whenever i saw it was her of course i was there uh you know it took me four seconds to get there some people thought that was uh, uh too long ironically you know the flip side is uh, i said it's because they're used to reactionary leaders they're not used to stable leaders who assess the situation is this a real issue or not and then if, if it is let's go full-fledged and, and solve it i'll tell you the the flip side to that is can you imagine a presidential candidate announcing his candidacy or leading the country and every little thing that happens constantly be like, oh, shiny object. Oh, there's noise over here. Oh, this. I'm tired of distracted leadership running this country. And, and so you ended up on the cover of the Daily Mail. Yes. And they said, <laughs> they said uh, you took too long, four yes. seconds. Like yes. That you could have yes. you know, four stopped seconds. everything you were That's doing. Right. Do, do you think you should have done that when she fell? Well, I didn't know that she had fallen because she was behind me, how far she was behind me. So uh, actually everyone that was there thought it was ha handled marvelously uh, because of the distance, because of the noise. There was no way to know uh, unless I stopped every time I heard a noise behind me to look to see it did something happen. But you know, we have great doctors uh, who had, had uh, been with her. They were watching the whole time. Uh, they cleared her to even be a part of that event, you know, and, and uh, it, it was uh, certainly a fluke thing. I think my son just wanted uh, to let the whole world know he's coming. I think, uh, <laughs> I think he's going to be a, a firebrand for America. I certainly hope, uh, you know, he loves God and loves America. Okay, I'm great that she's doing great. But your presidential, when I ask people that I'm having an interview with you, most people ask me, Roland, who? Mm -hmm. like, like half of the country doesn't know who you are. Right. And how do you feel running... Uh, for an election and everyone talks about Trump and DeSantis and they don't actually What makes you believe that you have a chance? Sure. Well a couple of things. I, I, I'm glad that they say Roland who? I want them to, to ask that question uh, The flip side is I want them to learn uh, The answer to that of course even if it's meant derogatory It is the right question to ask who is this person wanting to lead our country? Uh, I'll tell you, I have spent my life, and especially uh, the last decade or so, uh, not trying to be in the limelight, not trying to uh, seek attention, not trying to be a social media influencer. I have been, my head has been down, I've been hard at work for America, helping humanity across the world, helping underprivileged people, entrepreneurs and so forth in America and in Africa. Uh, and, and in other countries. Uh, so uh, that's kind of been my focus. But I'll tell you, as it relates to, uh, you know, Trump or DeSantis or, or others, uh, that, that really to me is not the real issue. Uh, ultimately, America doesn't want to rematch. Even the whole world and, and Americans look at this and go, after four years, <coughs> you still don't have anything better than these two options. Like, they, people, Americans want options. Uh, and I can tell you that even with some of the polls, other is polling in second place. Trump at 62% or so. Other was at 19%. And DeSantis was at 16% and everybody else under 5%. So I told him, I said, that's because you still haven't put my name on the polls. You know, <laughs> and then, then you other, you'll take, be able to take it off. But I firmly believe that America is looking at the lineup of candidates and saying, no, 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 no. And you know, the only new people getting in are other politicians. What does it take for them to understand 
America doesn't want a politician in office. We're tired of corruption. And uh, I was watching one of your interviews yesterday, and you were saying that there are only two of you in the GOP running for president. And yeah. were you referring to yourself? And who I was referring to myself and Trump at the time. DeSantis is now in. He's running to be the president. No one else is. But here's the thing. Trump, I'm not going to question his love for God or America, but one thing everyone knows is that he loves himself more than either God or America. He'll put <laughs> Trump first before he puts either one of them first. That's the first problem. The other thing is, you know, with, with a Trump presence, at this point, he's everything that I was raised not to be, you know, in the holler of West Virginia. He's everything I'm not, I'm going to raise my son not to be. Um, and I want people who respect other people, who respect uh, women, who, who, who treat people with dignity. Uh, and uh, in, in other countries uh, and American citizens and puts the country first, not themselves first. It should be a selfless thing, not a selfish thing. And I'll tell you, the Trump that's running now is different than the Trump of 2016. Trump 2016 was inspiring. Trump 2023 is bitter. Uh, Trump is running for two reasons, two reasons only. Revenge, political revenge, and legal cover. And DeSantis, well... We're still not sure which DeSantis is running, uh, but once we uh, find out which one of the DeSantis is running, and maybe we end up with a co-president, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, America has never had that before. Uh, but of course, I say that in jest to some degree, but uh, it is very true that that is a different nature of, uh, of a campaign and candidacy right now. But the thing with DeSantis is if, when I was running companies and leading companies, if I had a great regional manager of the state of Florida, uh, I would not promote him to the president of the company. That has nothing to do with it. Uh, in fact, that embodies the Peter principle, which is the mistake that companies and leaders make. What I would do is have him go teach and train other regional managers on how to run our company operations better in their respective states. Uh, so I think that you know, DeSantis has zero foreign policy and international diplomacy experience and i think the next president of the united states is going to be leading this country in or through a world war or at least a, a major one of the most major wars and battles of our history so that is critical that we have somebody with experience it's not the time to bring somebody up from the little leagues you know he's never negotiated with dictators um and, and, and regimes uh that were uh ranked 180 out of 180 on the world corruption scale uh, he can't out negotiate Mickey Mouse. I don't know how he's going to handle Putin, you know, or Xi Jinping. So be before I get back to you and your policies and why you're running, just mm -hmm. about Trump. Right now, he's leading in the polls mm -hmm. by almost 40 points, mm -hmm. and he has a huge base. How do you hope to appeal to those people? Because if those people hear you say what you just said now, they may not really vote for you. So how do you, and I know you talked about alone with God, that you are the majority. Yeah. How, how do you hope to win the GOP primaries if, you know, you... Yeah, I'll tell you, the, the way, our strategy to win the GOP primary uh, is, number one, uh, we're people of faith. Uh, that is my background. That's the cloth that I'm cut from. I do believe America needs God. I believe there is a war on God in America. Uh, and when I look around, when I see the failing economy, when I see the burgeoning debt, when I see the porous borders, uh, nobody's happy with immigration. Uh, American citizens aren't. Legal immigrants aren't. Illegal immigrants aren't. It's broken. It needs to be fixed. Uh, our education is failing. Our sixth grade, uh, you know, China teaches engineering to sixth graders, and our bachelor's degrees uh, that our university institutions are issuing are equal to like an eighth grade education from 1940. It, it, the disparity is unreal. They've got sixth graders uh, mastering STEM and we have 30 year olds trying to figure out if they're a boy or a girl. I mean, that's the discrepancy and, and that all translates directly into GDP. So for me, I plan to win on economy, national security and family. No one else is talking about family. You have to strengthen the families of the United States of America. You have to strengthen them if you want a strong nation. Every country on earth, if you start to attack the institution of the home, they will start putting laws against whatever rises up against it because they understand 
they have to protect that unit in order for their country to thrive. So um, I just feel like we've gone so far. <laughs> we already talked about the big things, but I, I wanted us to go back to, you know, where in how it all started. You know, when did you know that maybe one day you may even run for president? Well, I never thought I would. I ran for state senate in 2012. I lost by 65 votes. I'd only registered 90 days before and thought, uh, let me see if I could do this. So it was a great experience. And of course, in, uh, my father going through that process with me, I got to see a firsthand glimpse and uh, has been a great state senator for the state of West Virginia for the past several years and been reelected twice and uh, had a majority whip there of the super majority in uh, the state senate. But for me, I always just thought I would be an ambassador. I liked promoting America and American values uh, to other countries and to helping people grow and experience what we have here. But one of the catalysts, a lot of things have been happening since 2016, 2017 that have been steering my life this direction, but I had no idea that this is where it would end up. None whatsoever, not in a million years. And, but one of the, the last catalyst for me that that said I must do it I knew that I was called to do it it wasn't let me just see what happens let me just run let's look at a career move let's try to do something no it was for a very specific purpose def with definiteness of purpose and clarity and focus and for me that uh, happened in August of last year when I knew this is I'm, what I'm supposed to do. And uh, I was with a U.S. delegation to South Sudan and through a series of meetings and so forth, I finally, it's like uh, in that scenario, the veil fell and my eyes were opened that the way we knew, have known the government lies to American citizens. We've known that we've been lied to on issue after issue after issue, whether it's COVID or the origin of the vaccine or who killed JFK or this or that. I mean, everything for a long time, you know, weapons of mass destruction, we keep getting lied to repeatedly. But I didn't realize that that extended beyond our borders. And when I realized fully that we do the same thing to other nations and other countries, and yet we say we're for peace, but we create war. We're negotiating with other governments, and we've got a machete chopping off their legs underneath the table, and because they don't have the finesse of maybe some of our American diplomats, they turn around and slap us, and then because that's visible, we act like we're the victims. And we're saying, I can't believe you just said that or did that. We're going to sanction you. Well, you've been cutting my legs off, but nobody saw that. Well, I saw that, and I said, no wonder we are, uh, countries want to go to war, and there are alliances forming, and BRICS is gaining momentum, and they're trying to take down the American dominance because of how we have abused our influence uh, in many respects. So when I saw the corruption, that we were actually more corrupt, we were better at being corrupt than some of the corrupt nations we were trying to sanction for being corrupt. And so I wanted to run for president so that I could, to, to have God's blessing on this nation once again, first of all, and secondly, to do right by American citizens and to do right by other nations and the peoples of other nations. See, I don't view China as our enemy, or Russia is not our, uh, the Chinese people are not our enemy, the Russian people are not our enemy. These are people, these are human beings. Uh, it is ideology and uh, that is a problem and that we are at war with of some of the regimes in these countries. And, and so you talk about God a lot, you know, mm. I, and I read, not read, I, I watched one of your speeches where you talk about how you intend to win. Mm. There are 270... 210 million, 210 million people. Professing who, Christians in America. Uh, I need 90 million of them to win. Uh, they're the silent majority. Everyone knows it uh, from every party. Uh, and so if they wake up, it's over. Because they know that none of the current candidates, none of them, and there's not any on the potential candidate list incoming, that actually is one of them. There are people who pander to them. There are people who cater to them. But 
you know that it's uh, it's the wolf trying to be the sheep and, and so uh, we're not worried about that also there's 65 million Hispanics in the Hispanic Latino community uh, has have, have declared me the, 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 mm -hmm. their their candidate their man uh, when uh, well several weeks ago uh, we uh, we were able to uh, speak at the I'm Hispanic sorry, business gala okay and uh, uh, and it was uh, for the award ceremony for Hispanic businesses uh, in the United States that have flourished and done well. And, uh, and so we, we received great welcome and reception there. And I'll tell you, the entire immigrant vote uh, is very important to me. Uh, out of any party, we have a immigration restoration plan uh, that I believe solves that problem. So immigrants. Uh, legal immigrants, illegal immigrants, and American citizens, it is something that actually helps the United States of America. Okay, so that takes me to who you are and your policies. Like, you know, that's how you want to win. You have Christians in the country, but you are not the only one running. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing is what makes you different from the other people? Trump, DeSantis, and all those people, Nikki Haley, mm -hmm. and you know, the people running for president. And how do you, why do you believe that you are the person to bring about that change? Mm -hmm. We are going to get into foreign policies sure, and sure. Ukraine and Ethiopia and Sudan, but yeah. why do you think you are the person to I lead think if the U.S. right now? You, you don't want an insider, and everyone knows that. They all talk about draining the swamp, and Trump could, didn't drain the bathtub. When he had four years so he's he's not going to do it it's that with another chance uh, in fact he hired the swamp at the very end and it caused us lockdowns and a number of uh, mandates and a number of other things that hurt or killed a lot of people so uh i lump all of them in the same category uh they're politicians they're they're all they've been here they have tried we're still in the boat we're worse off now we have more debt than we've ever had our children are not smarter our schools are not better they're not safer and, uh, and, and inflation is up. So we need new ideas. Uh, we need to get the country thinking towards a 22nd century America. Not what does today look like in America. What, does, what do we want America to look like in the 22nd century and start moving that direction? And so that's the difference between me and every other candidate. And so I want to talk about those ideas. Like mm -hmm. if you can be a bit more specific. Sure. Like what do you intend to bring that we don't have now. What are those ideas yeah. that you intend? Two to give? big ones. Two big ones. Uh, energy, Ener the energy sector, and I, you know, everyone's just saying uh, drill or things like that. Look, there's multiple ways for alternative energy. Uh, we spent trillions of dollars on alternative energy sources that are not actually as sustainable as everyone uh, thought they would be. But we should be doing clean coal and oil shale. Uh, there's 300 years at the current consumption rates of coal left in the, in, 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 that we have now. And then we have uh, 200 years of oil shale. We have, uh, and this is according to the U.S. Department of Energy, we have 9,000 years, 9,000 years, that's a whole lot longer than we've even been in existence, um, of methane hydrates. Uh, no one's even talking about that. But that's also where all the new jobs will come from. Uh, much of the new jobs, whenever AI continues to grow and take over a lot of those, people are going to need, and government shrinks and, and is reduced in size. And so you've got to have other burgeoning job markets. Energy sector is one of them. And then the biggest one is nuclear energy. Nuclear energy uh, is the cleanest, so it appeases people who are highly focused on the environment. I mean, you're talking about in two years, uh, currently uh, saving 165 million uh, uh, tons of uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions a year, and um, and so when you're when you're able to do that, and and it's it's so it's clean and it long, lasts long because our submarines and our naval vessels we use nuclear energy to fuel them. Uh, we when we fuel a submarine, it never gets refueled for the life of the submarine. Well, and, but my car, I'm having to refill every every other day. And so you believe that the whole climate agenda by President Biden is... You know, the interesting thing about the climate, entire climate thing, yes, I, I, I think they take snippets of, of things we should be doing to tend the environment. Clean air, clean water. My, I, I, we've done a lot of clean water initiatives in Africa. Uh, 
and so clean water is a huge issue so from an environment environmental perspective i care deeply about clean water fresh air tending our forests our lands i have technological innovations and work with people and i believe there's even better ideas out there on how we can handle hurricane mitigation and uh earthquake, uh, natural disasters, and how we handle these things uh, that will save lives and, and reduce the, the cost to insurance companies. But I go back to uh, on, the, on the nuclear energy, you've got, you've got energy sources that when we start exploiting these and using these that we already have at our disposal, we have more uh, uh, oil shale currently on, in the ground domestically than Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Iran, these places combined. So why are we borrowing or buying when we should be selling? That's why I'm going to get gas to a dollar. That's how I'm going to get gas to a dollar a gallon for people. And we'll get oil per barrel down to $20, $25 a barrel. Uh, that's huge. America needs to start being the lender, not the borrower. So what was the second big idea? I, I heard the first. Energy is one. The second one is education. Okay. Education. Look, look, this also plays into the economy. That plays into Social Security uh, being funded, fully funded, uh, but ultimately in paying off our national debt. I, I don't like the conversation around uh, just are we going to reduce the deficit. I think that's a shallow conversation. I My conversations that I have and want to have is how do we eliminate the national debt. Uh, we were debt free at mm -hmm. one time. Uh, there are countries today that are debt free. There is a path to get there, uh, and you can do it through selling our energy to the world, number one, which we have more than many of these countries combined, and that's how they generate all of their revenues, not even through taxation. They even pay their citizens because of how much money they get through this. And yet we have more, and uh, with less population in some cases. So then you take uh, education. And right now, as you know, education, we're failing kids, teachers are frustrated, parents are frustrated, uh, and the system is, is taxed. Here's the thing. We, we need to look at having bachelor's degrees run simultaneous with the high school years so that when people turn 18, they graduate high school, they are getting either a bachelor's degree or a trade certificate if they go the vocational route, trade route, um, at the time of graduation. What's happened is we've had education creep over the last 70, 80 years where, you know, people used to be done with school at 12 to 14 years old. And then if you got a higher education, you were still in the workforce by 18 or so. And we had shorter work expectancies at that point. And now uh, what we might do is extend the school day a little bit. It reduces the load on K through 12 teachers because they're working less, which helps with equal better pay at that point and then you have the the trades or the degreed courses that afternoon uh, but another advantage to them graduating at 18 with a bachelor's degree and extending a school day is because the work day extended it used to end at uh, 2 to 3 p.m. and it has extended over the years so women have not are the ones mostly affected by the school hours and so a lot of the unequal pay that is concerning uh, it's because of the this three to five time frame so if you extend the day you allow women to even take higher paying jobs because they can better fulfill the responsibilities of the higher paying jobs and at the same time we reduce teen pregnancy we reduce reduce drug use and, and overdose and suicide tremendously because most of them are happening between 2.30 and 5 p.m. after school when they are unsupervised. So I think and then the biggest shift with everything is now instead of people waiting until they get out of college and then they take a few years off, travel Europe and then find themselves at age 30 and decide what they're going to do with their life, now we have people entering the workforce at age 18. That's 12 more years of productivity per person. And when you look at the economic benefits of that, Social Security is fully funded, your national debt, even if it's $35 trillion whenever I inherit it, uh, your, that, even with those numbers, would be paid off in six years. And so you are running as a GOP presidential candidate. Mm. And 
most of you guys are white and mm. white men and you need to appeal to the majority of the country yes the brown and black and white people how do you intend to appeal to those people who don't look like you well it's a good question i for me i appeal to them on the thing that unites all of us and that is our faith in god so 81 percent of americans believe in god according to the most recent gallup poll and i will tell you that that unites everyone can unite around that we could we as you start parsing out issues and you start parsing out demographics obviously different people watch different tv shows you know in business we used to have market sec segments and and we would always we you know it was illegal even in hiring to obviously uh, discriminate on any of these issues so we learned how to find our target market right mba courses study target markets uh, but for some reason in politics that conversation is is somewhere down the road and they focus on the things we could never focus on in business uh, so first of all we unite around our common objectives uh, which is a better life you know uh, the head of our hispanic latino caucus uh, either from chile and you know they're here before they were came here for a better life uh, the people that uh, we work with and the, the, the Kenyans and and uh, Malawians and uh, South, the Sudanese that are here uh, Ethiopians Nigerians you know uh, Ghana I can't leave Ghana out I love I love our people in Ghana you know the, we, we, we don't even worry about those things we're not even looking at those things when I'm trying to as president make America better for American citizens that's what I'm trying to do. So uh, there are disparities that need to be addressed. Uh, prison system, prison reform. I mean, there are issues that affect different segments of people unjustly. Yes, so I was going to talk about those issues because you need to appeal to black people and brown people and the issues of discrimination, inequalities. How, how do you, what's your view of black people and inequalities and well, and how to there's a lot that. of injustice from a lot of different groups, you know. And now we're not we're not only struggling with racism in America, uh, and by the way, all over the world. Uh, but but also we have what they call reverse racism and different aspects to it. Um, but I think you know the way I'm addressing the specific needs of different communities is, for example, prison reform. That inordinately affects the black community uh, more than any other demographic uh, and part of the way I'm addressing that twofold uh, first of all through strengthening families when you strengthen marriages and families you cannot you cannot divorce the data on that subject that 91% uh, of incarcerated black men uh, come from fatherless homes you cannot get around some specific statistics like that uh, so what I want to do is help them in every home see you, it used to be taboo to get a divorce right and then now you can go any street corner in America and see I can get one for $99 in a week from now you know we got a got a clean start uh, so and that was one of the uh, main in the top five reasons of why the Roman Empire fail uh, and so we have to strengthen homes which strengthens the black community tremendously that reduces the teen pregnancy and drug use it reduces uh, uh incarceration rates and then i also say that uh really they're great entrepreneurs a lot of the inner cities when we would go in and do entrepreneur workshops uh they're great entrepreneurs and the reason i focused on inner cities was because i knew they knew how to be creative they were innovative if if you gave them you know a hundred things they can't do i.e laws they're going to find 20 ways around it. That's actually just a good entrepreneur, so right? Do, do, do you believe that black people deserve compensation? You know, we, we see the issues in California, people saying that you should pay us for slavery. Reparations? No, reparations. no, no. I, I, no, because uh, first of all, it has gone both ways uh, for generations. Uh, even in America, uh, blacks owned slaves just like whites owned slaves and so and i just i don't believe it on the on uh on, on several reasons i i think there are 
we have to do right now. We ha we can't, we're struggling getting America right now, much less paying for what's happened in the past. Uh, and I actually think that they have tried to do a semblance of reparations. Uh, I don't think it has been effective, but I think affirmative action, you know, they meant well when they es established it, but I think it has hurt as much it is, as it has helped. I, I think it has kept uh, a minority community suppressed. Uh, and I think there's other ways that they are suppressed, but there are also solutions to freeing them. And a lot of it is freeing them in their mind, saying, you can go do this. You have to, uh, there are some systematic things that can be done. And then there's also the side where they have to know that they can. Those systematic things, like what should change, for instance? Well, I think uh, education, uh, you know, uh, our education system has failed because even in the grades, in the amount of subjects that are actually taught in inner cities aren't equal to what's taught in the others. Now, they, the teachers in the administrations will say that's because of behavioral discipline. I mean, if 90% of your day is solving problems and trying not to get shot as a teacher, uh, that's hard to... A hard environment to teach in, um, or if there if if there's a if there's physical violence, uh, so that the solution to those things are start at home, and so I go back to the best thing I can do for the black community is strengthen homes. So much of it is the home, it, the, your character of the child comes out of the home. And a lot of the problems that we face too in America is because America lacks is lacking in character many of our people are lacking in character and so the less integrity assist uh, that is in this population the more government regulation has to come in to try to protect people but the so the more integrity the less regulation the less integrity the more regulation and that is what usually hurts minority communities okay so you're talking about home but how do you intend to do that to strengthen families. To strengthen. The first thing is I want to appoint a family czar. Uh, we have a man that has uh, decades of experience in supporting families, strengthening families, uh, equipping families. You have to start with marriage, helping the husband and wife. The best way that you can uh, raise your children is for spouses to love one another. Uh, and that might sound foreign, but a lot of people aren't happy <laughs> uh, in those kind of things. And But th there's things that uh, you can do that help that. And a lot of times, I mean, they got married for a reason. There, there's love somewhere in there. Uh, but sometimes life just gets so complicated and trying to pay the bills and put food on the table and work gets hard. And, uh, and, they, and they just kind of drift apart. So, and when you, so, so the families are, uh, can have, we'll have programs uh, that strengthen marriages and homes and families. And so you are running for president and you will need to appeal to women. And that mm -hmm. brings me to abortion. Mm. What's your views on abortion? What are your views on abortion? Yeah, so first of all, I obviously hold a biblical worldview on, on any social issue or any issue I can find there. I, try, I align my positions with, with the Bible, uh, not try to impose my views on it. Uh, so that's kind of my, my baseline net net. But let me tell you my view on abortion is that I will review any legislation that Congress puts before me that better protects the life of the unborn. But I will tell you this. Uh, any legislation so pro-life yes but I, I don't like to just use the term uh, because of what I'm about to say uh, it's not just about life to me it is protecting the unborn and the vulnerable but I want to see uh, any legislation that includes the exceptions for rape and incest which are the most common exceptions I want the ex exceptions if anyone triggers the exception clause I want, if we're going to take the life of the baby, I want to take the life of the perpetrator, a death penalty. I want to see that added. Now, let me tell you the problem with that. The definition of rape has changed over the last few years. Until 2020, and maybe a few years prior, but from the 50s when, and, and 60s when, when Roe v. Wade went into effect, 
rape, we all viewed, considered rape was something that happened to a woman that was running in a park by a stranger or walking in a parking lot and a stranger, it was usually a stranger taking advantage of, of a woman. But the definition of rape has changed in the last few years and this is, I believe, going to be the national conversation. What is rape? Because in the last few years, it, the definition has changed to unwanted penetration. Well, think about that. Who's to say? And when do you decide? So consensual or not, it, unwanted. It could be. So and what we're seeing is that a vast majority of those claiming unwanted penetration is now, it's no longer by strangers, it's by romantic people they have been romantically or physically involved with. And maybe they're on again, off again, or maybe even in a husband and wife relationship. Maybe you, one was in the mood and the other was not. And, and so there's unwanted penetration and, and there's a, a, a baby as a result of that. And then they claim rape and it's a, a spouse, you know, a boyfriend or, or, or a lover. So I, I think that needs to be the conversation uh, as when you have a, the exception clauses because I do want to see a life for a life. And don't you think that if, if it's worth aborting the baby for, it's worth aborting the perpetrator, the oppressor? Okay, so you're against abortion but without exception with exception and and you i i am for yes i want to protect the life of the unborn yeah. just so you're against ab so you're against that abortion. yes 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 now uh but i also understand and recognize there's going to be exceptions we're not going to have legislation in this country uh i can't foresee where no abortion is allowed under any circumstances except in the, protecting the life of the mother and this is very personal to me uh because the Pfizer documents that came out said that the, their vaccine was 80 to 85 uh, percent created abortion on demand, basically. It was more 80 to 85 percent more effective than the abortion pill. We lost our first child, my wife and I in the womb probably due to that vaccine um, so when there are a lot of other ways than just did someone abort when you find out that things that were designed to protect or to support or help society was actually weaponized against uh, intentionally or unintentionally and I think that varies based on who you're talking about but uh, yes I am for protecting the life of the unborn my wife's due any day having contractions already and uh, you know even she said she said people will say you know my body my choice or they and she said this baby has hijacked my body <laughs> my, I wish it was my body because I wouldn't do this 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 and I would feel different but, uh, but so that's her perspective. But what will you say to those who may tell you when you see the polls, last election, abortion won, and who will say if that's your position, you may lose a lot of women, especially people on the left. Well, I'm not going to pander to win an election. Uh, I'm not trying to run far, 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 try to outdo anyone on the floor for her. I'm not trying to outdo anybody. I'm not going, which is what they typically do during primaries, and then they move to the center during elections. To me, that's a fraud. And anybody who does that, all of America should say that you are disqualified because you are a chameleon. I can't trust you because I don't know what your positions are. If I'm talking, to, if you're talking to them, you're going to have this position. If I talk to you, you hold that position. So my position is the position is the position. Now that doesn't mean you can't. Uh, uh, work with people. I'm not trying to impose everything on America. You can't write an executive order that just immediately does this. So I, I couch all that saying, you know, the Congress of the United States will actually is the one who will end up putting something on my desk. Uh, but I'm telling you what I would be looking for in that legislation uh, to sign it would absolutely be something that I know it will have exceptions. Uh, but I want to see that if it is for rape or incest and that does it, that's if they trigger 
the exception cost yeah, and for rate rates. What type of exception? Is it, you know, four months, two months, two weeks, six weeks? You know, everyone talks about six weeks. They talk about the, the, the number of weeks, and, and that is a little bit more nuanced because uh, the baby's hearts start beating at different times, and I, I was not aware of that. It's not like all babies at month, uh, week four start beating. Uh, but and I do this, uh, understand that they, uh, most babies' hearts do start beating by six weeks. Yes, I like anything that is the, the tightest, the best way we can protect the life of the unborn. I do believe that. Look, I actually think, you're talking about connecting with women voters, I think every mother out there appreciates someone who is at least going to protect the life of the unborn. Uh, and then if, uh, if the, an exception is triggered, that we're not just going to abort the baby, that we're going to actually solve their problem. You're talking about healing some trauma. Uh, that would do it. But I, I can't, I don't want to leave it there. The legislation has to include better support for new mothers. Once again, we are living this now, my wife and I, and I'm telling you, they gave us a list of things insurance isn't going to cover that we have to cover out of pocket. Well, how, how is a new mother who is, uh, who can't afford to put feed herself, who's wondering how in the world can I afford to have this child? What is she supposed to do? She can't even afford to have the baby, much less take care of the baby. So government, I do believe that we have to have, and by the way, if we put more, all the money we put into Planned Parenthood and other organizations that promoted the other side into actual women's health to help them uh, have the baby, and if there was no cost involved to having a baby, uh, and there was support for that mother ongoing, I think more women would actually choose to see it through. And since you keep mentioning women, uh, who is a woman? We, we're <laughs> having that debate now uh, where we don't really know, you know. No, we know what a woman is. You know what a woman is. I know what a woman is. We know a man from a woman. That's the, this is the problem. And, and we're, see, America's in a shadow war right now. That's my problem with some of my opponents that are fighting woke wars. I'm glad they're fighting woke wars. It's dumb. It's naive. It sounds silly even having to say those kind of things, that there's two gender. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's common sense to anybody around the world. Uh, you know, I've had foreign dignitaries and leaders say, we hope you will build the wall, but not to keep people out so that your mental illness doesn't spread to our country. They really believe that. They don't want it to spread to them. Uh, and you, when you look at some of the laws uh, that some of these other countries are passing, Ghana had passed it, Uganda obviously just passed, anything that attacks the, uh, the institution of the home, they are against because of how bad it affects the economy and national security. So you don't believe in the man can wake up tomorrow and no. identify as a woman? Well, now identify, they, they can identify all day long as whatever they want to be. You can identify you know, uh, as a millionaire too, but it's not going to help you at the grocery store in the checkout line. I, look, the issue with the identification is that it does cater to mental illness. When you look at the, the insane asylums or the mental health, long-term mental health institutions that America used to have, when you would go in them, it was mostly filled with people who who thought they were something else. And by the way, it changed every day, or it changed frequently. And that's what's even happening now with in the transgender world and in others, where even some of their spokespeople are now, they switch back, or they switch to a different gender. So whatever you identify as today, whatever your pronouns are today, you may have a different set tomorrow. Uh, so I don't think you uh, enable it. I don't think you support I think you help people get help, the help that they need. Oh, so you... So the question is, how do you intend to protect the LGBTQ community? There are millions of them in yes. America. How, how, how will you be protecting them? Well, if, I have a lot of them that believe, support me. Yeah, if you and believe that many of them are mentally ill, if did I get No, 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 no. I, I'm not saying people who are lesbian, gay, no, not at all. Okay. Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think it's a lifestyle choice that they've made, uh, and they sometimes change you know their choices just like people you know all people do men and women change partners they change, I mean, there's a there's a lot of you know variance in that um, what we're specifically talking about with the gender identity and gen and trans and gender transition and child mutilation is pure wickedness and evil end of story that is different than gay and lesbian I, I I'm telling you we, we have people in Florida 
um, I wish she was here with me, uh, helps out a lot with, uh, with things, but she's one of my biggest supporters, uh, two of them down there that are my biggest supporters uh, that have been uh, gay or a semblance of lesbians their entire life. One's probably in her late 20s and one's in her 70s. Um, dear people, great friends. But what you'll find is a lot of people in the LGB world do not approve or agree with going after children, um, and especially with the gender transitioning. They don't believe that. These are separate issues. Now, the, the, the gender transition people want to lump themselves in with this because this is accepted, uh, but even this group is saying that's not what we're about. We want to love who we want to love. We want to marry who we want to marry. We want to have sexual relations with who we want to have sexual relations with. Uh, but this is pure wickedness and evil. They want to identify as whatever it is so that they can do all manner of evil uh, against children. They Look, if, 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 if you're a 50-year-old male and you identify as a 16-year-old today and you take advantage of an 11-year-old or 15-year-old, let me go younger, because some of 16-year-olds try as an adult, that, that, that's, uh, uh, you're not skirting around the law at that point. Uh, you belong in prison. Uh, and I get that there's basically three types of people in prison, a third that probably are innocent don't belong there, a third that need to be in an insane asylum, a mental institution, they don't need prison, that's not helping them. And then the third, they say, uh, prison's not strong enough you know, for them. And I would put people who mutilate children, even if the child says that they want this, we in society protect children from a lot of things that they think that they want at that time. Uh, you know, if you wanted to be a pirate when you were five years old, we're not going to chop off your leg and poke out your eye so you can be a pirate. You might identify as a pirate today. You dress up, you put on an eye patch, but you've gotta, you'd have to live with that. And even in the transition world, as adults, they transition frequently. What do you think is going to happen with a, with a 10-year-old child that transitions? They're going to transition a whole lot more times than the adults. So we are almost coming to an end. We've had, you know, we've talked about race, we've talked about women and LGBTQ community. What are your views on the Second Amendment? Oh, I'm all for it. I mean, you can't have enough. Now, I, I will say this. On the Second Amendment, it's not just about sporting and hunting. I, I don't like when they, when they take that. Um, I would say you need more. Uh, the whole reason uh, for it was not to protect your ability to go hunting. And obviously, I grew up in West Virginia. Uh, but even biblically, once again, I try to take a lot of my positions from what is universal standard, not just my perspective. And biblically, in, in our New Testament, it talks about that if you do not have a sword, it's better to sell your shirt and go buy ability to defend yourself uh, than to go without per, uh, defense. And the reason I'm asking is because almost more than a hundred people are gone down every day in the mm -hmm. U.S. How do you intend to solve what the Biden administration calls the gun epidemic? Yeah, well, it's a mental health epidemic, not a gun epidemic. Um, we had uh, people were, were killing each other with knives and machetes and, and still are in many parts of the world. See, this is how I know that that's not a fair comparison because a lot of the countries that we, that we work yeah. with, uh, there are no guns. There, there's not very many. The only people who have them are the cartels or the gangs. Uh, uh, a lot of times even the military does not have the weapons that they need in, in those nations. So how are there so many deaths and killings? Because they're using all manner of, of, of weapons. Uh, people, why, why in prison do they not just block guns? Why can't you have a pair of scissors in prison? Because you'll use it as a weapon and kill somebody. Why do they not have certain kinds of knives on airplanes? Because you could stab somebody, they use plastic, right? I mean. You use whatever you have. Cain killed Abel with a rock. I mean, you use whatever is around because the problem is not the weapon. The problem is the heart. This is a heart issue. It is a, it, a, it, and, and so we have to, and once again, I address that through strengthening families and homes because you have to get at the heart. If we improve the character of the United States of America as a body and as individuals, 
then we start solving the problems we care about. As long as we try to cut off the branches and solve the symptom instead of addressing the root, which is the wickedness, you know, that we have in, in, in a heart that where we, which is why I don't want a Trump as president where we're exalting, yes, political revenge on either side, you know. Uh, we yes. have to help people get past that. So, but do you believe in reforms like background checks and I do. Like that? Yes, yes, yes. Rational things with with background checks uh, and, and even certain medications. There are certain medications we know uh, alter the mind, mind altering drugs. We absolutely, if they're on those, I don't think we should be selling them them guns. Um, but uh, so so you have to check those things. Obviously, watch lists. I, I'm discouraged that the laws that we already have in place seem to not work as they ought to in the system. There are some of the the most recent shootings happened because uh, they 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 should not have passed the background check. It, they, they were already flagged on the FBI's watch list. So how in the world did they buy it? So we have to button up you know different systems of existing laws before you go try and you know take away more freedom. The goal of a free nation is to keep people as free as possible. Um, and then limited government, less government, uh, until people are not uh, uh, responsible. So, um, second to my last question, yes. immigration. Mm. You know, the border, the, you know, the southern, you know, the southern border. What, what do you, how do you, how will you describe the way President Biden has handled immigration and how do you intend to fix it yeah well I would describe how the current administration has handled it as a disaster uh, and how I plan to fix it is to seal the southern border by any means necessary they're actually starting to even use the northern border uh, the Canadian border uh, so seal our borders uh, by the way talking about uh, biblical policies walls are biblical uh, uh, proverbs are the wise proverbs teach us that uh, a, a person who can't control their own spirit uh, is worse than a city that is without walls because that makes a city or a nation vulnerable to attack that's why countries through all of human recorded history have had secure borders so we have to secure the borders and my response is by any means necessary uh, if 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 Homeland Security and if Border Patrol says that's how we need more walls, higher walls, deeper walls, more technology, more people, manpower, whatever it is, we're going to do it. Uh, and then you cannot solve the immigration problem in the United States until you solve the border problem. You have to stop the bleeding before you implement the system uh, or else the system never actually starts working. So you have to stop the bleeding, then you fix it. And I have a one year, I want a one year application process. The problem is there's so much fraud right now in immigration uh, through with the attorneys, with uh, people bringing people across and charging ridiculous amounts and, and taking people's life savings just to go to America. Uh, and so uh, we have to take, eliminate that by having a good process for them here. I want all immigration applications processed in 12 months, legal immigration, because I want to reward you for coming in the front door and then all illegal immigrants that are currently here. I have a seven-year restoration program uh, to citizenship for them. We, and that's for economic reasons and it's for national security reasons. Pretending they aren't here or acting like that we don't see them or that they have to stay in the shadows is very bad for America. No, I wish we had zero illegal immigration, but that's not the hand that I've been dealt or we have been dealt. So just to be clear, you won't deport them on day one. That's no, what I will not Trump deport them on day one. No, I will not deport them on day one. Now, if we haven't done background checks on them, I need to know who's in the United States, and there's probably a bunch in the United States that do need to be deported. But I will not say, no, we're deporting illegal immigrants uh, on day one. I will, But we need to deport all of those with criminal records that are here illegally on day one. Absolutely. And I realize that you didn't mention President Biden by name. You said the current administration. What, what Out are of your respect. Views? Yeah. I, I, I don't respect him I do respect the office of the president and I don't want to speak ill about him but I will speak about the wicked and evil ideologies that his administration espouses okay but I'll tell you this uh, Simon there's not one presidential candidate that has or any comprehension 
of artificial intelligence and the role it's going to play in our military, our world wars, in education, or the economy literally over the next four or five years. They don't even, they can't even fix their smartphone and troubleshoot it. They have no clue about cybersecurity and they have no clue about artificial intelligence. And that should be the main discussion and conversation in this presidential race. And, and really talking about artificial intelligence is changing everything. Everything. You know, everything. The way I realized that I'm able to code, write code, I write plugins. You know, I used to pay hundreds of dollars to people in India and different places, and yes. I can do it now just by. How, how do you uh, do you believe there is a threat to humanity? Or, uh, yeah, so what, I, what I, do you think of AI? I called for a cybersecurity, which is where it started for me. Data security was what I did in the corporate world a lot, and then going into technology and hardware, software, software as a service. Uh, but it started for me in data security. And so I wanted a cybersecurity committee and panel uh, to have uh, established baselines for the United States because the Veterans Administration, uh, uh, several others, uh, government is the biggest, uh, most vulnerable network. And they were the ones having the biggest data breaches, <laughs> not the corporations. And they were having, Bank of America, others were having data breaches. But it was our military, the veterans. I mean, don't you think our nation state enemies would like to know who was over there fighting against them and then they could target? Well, they did. They, they got our data They got of, of the veterans. Um, and so we, ha we had started with cybersecurity. That goes into and then artificial intelligence. The difference between artificial intelligence and the Internet, the Internet kind of took off and then we tried to layer cybersecurity on top of it which it never works because the uh, of, of the nature of it the, the cybersecurity has to be the foundation so that's whenever we started doing artificial intelligence we can't make the same mistake with AI AGI artificial general intelligence which we're trying to get to with quantum computing and so forth uh, until you have the baseline of cybersecurity it will change we have to proactively have uh, uh, panels on artificial intelligence at the federal level. I was having a, a, a meeting a couple of years ago with the head of artificial intelligence for the Pentagon, and I just could not believe my. I had just gotten back from a foreign country where I was discussing things with their military uh, and national security matters, and uh, you know this the person I was having these conversations with was more interested in getting to happy hour and uh, than it was really solving some problems, and I thought. Our enemies are working 24 hours a day to defeat us, and you're worried about meeting some people and, and worried about your three-week vacation. You don't understand the world we are living in right now. And so I firmly believe that artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence, is uh, artificial intelligence is great for the healthcare. It is great for um, a lot of business use cases. Makes it more efficient. But the contrary side to that is it will be used for nefarious purposes, especially uh, AGI. China, Russia, North Korea, they are all advanced. We are within weeks right now in terms of, of uh, the competitiveness of where we are. We are within weeks of each other. That is very scary because it is a, it could be a spe species ending event. However, it will not be because of we're, we're already told of kind of what the end looks like. Uh, and that's not it. But it will be disaster. It can be disastrous. But we should keep it. The chat GPT, and we should use it for now. We should. We should. Oh, of course. I, I mean, look, some some people legal. are saying people are using it for for serve as their own attorney. They're getting great legal advice and how to do things and how. Uh, so it's it's helping in a lot of ways. But that's the proper uses of artificial intelligence. You know, there's great ways to use the internet. There's bad ways of using the internet. All technology is going to have that. Uh, yin yang to it in the opposites uh, but I'll, I, I just I go back to artificial general intelligence is something that we will not be able to contain at some point that's why Putin said several years in 2017 he said uh, and he's right I, I we should have had an American leader saying it first but whoever is the first to reach AGI will rule the world if you did nothing else but focus on artificial general intelligence because here's the thing if you're if you're Russia and and I'm America and uh, we lob a bomb over to you, it's going to be a smart missile, uh, and you've got AGI. When it gets a certain space, it's hacking in and already redirecting it, sending it back to its point of origin. And so that brings me to my last topic: 
foreign policy. Mm. You're talking about Russia, and you know we have this one in Ukraine where the U.S. is investing on ha, has spent 115 billion. Yeah, 115 billion dollars. Uh, what do you think of the war in Ukraine? Do you, if you're elected president next year, uh, will you? H how will you resolve it? How will you bring the conflict to an end? Will you talk to Putin directly or? Will you try to oh, I'd be talking to Putin directly and Zelensky directly. Uh, and there are, uh, we do have allies as well that are already trying to uh, negotiate some of that, uh, negotiate peace as well. And I was asked a couple of weeks ago if I would be willing to help as part of the mediation process, uh, just from the diplomacy background that I have. But, you know, the bottom line is I want peace immediately there. Um, I think we were sold, like I said, the government has lied to us about many, many things. Ukraine is no exception. That does not mean uh, that I'm for or against Ukraine. It means mm -hmm. I'm against being lied to. Uh, there are things you can do if you know what's actually happening and then you can have the right solution to the problem. The problem is when you bring me a fake problem and I give you a real solution to that fake problem but that's not the real problem, then you're not going to actually solve the real problem. That's the mess we're in today with Russia and Ukraine. If Russia did went to the Mexico and did on their border what we did used Ukraine to do to Russia we would have already absolutely obliterated all of Mexico annihilated it uh, if they remotely did what we used the Ukrainians to do Ukrainians can't st sneeze uh, without us giving them permission. They can't take a sip of water without us saying it's okay. They're not doing anything unless the U.S. So I, told I, them to. I guess my question is, are you going to continue to support Ukraine when you're elected president next year? I'm, going, I'm not going to, to keep sending money that until our national debt is paid off, until American citizens are taken care of. Uh, I, am, I am out of the foreign aid era and into the lending era for the United States. Is it better for you as a consumer to borrow money, spend money on your credit card, or if you have so much money, you can give him a $10,000 loan? It's better to be the lender and earn interest than to be the borrower and pay because the borrower is subject to the lender. Well, we're 31.46 and counting trillion beholden to, to, to other, other places, um, including China. Uh, so I do will have China uh, have a $10 trillion rep, uh, reparations for COVID. Uh, we only owe them $1 trillion, but they're going to owe us $9 trillion and net out our one. Um, and Japan being our largest debt holder, uh, <clears throat> that was reparations essentially. Uh, but why the United States doesn't do that to other countries? Every country we've given foreign aid to since 1960 uh, is worse off. Uh, most of them have been African countries. And, and I have the list of what their GDP is now, how much it's down, what it's changed. The lowest is 9% in Uganda, uh, is 9% is worse, poorer today than it was in 1960 when we started giving aid uh, to, uh, to the con uh, giving aid period, foreign aid. And then 73% uh, uh, is the worst, and that was in the Republic of Congo. So, no, we're going to fix our problems here in America. Uh, I support peace day one. I'm not supporting Russia. I'm not supporting Ukraine in that sense. Uh, we can't just stop what we have done. We have, co we have commitments and we have allies that we've committed some things to. And I, so I don't want to put myself in a situation like Biden did with Afghanistan. And we have a hasty retreat just because I wish we weren't there. Unfortunately, we are there. We need to, and I go back to, and it's the same answer for Taiwan and China. I will protect American interests anywhere in the world, in any country, with whatever force is necessary, at all costs. I will do it. I will so protect, protect American interests. Taiwan. I, no, that is the difference. I will protect American interests in wherever they may be found on this continent. I will not go to war for, on behalf of a nation to protect a segment of our interest in that country. That's the delineation that I have. That's where I think we got off in Ukraine. Well, I think we have we had American interests there, and we felt the the strategy that they went with was to protect some American interests, which some would say was a cover up, not American interests, but to protect what uh, American interests there. We actually uh, 
had to make it a nation a national thing that's what I am not willing to do I'm mm. not trying to go to war I'm not a warmonger I seek peace but with wise counsel I'll make war and I'll tell you what will mm. separate me as a president from all the presidents of my generation I won't just respond if you force my hand to where uh, I have to respond militarily it's not going to be an equal and op opposite reaction it's going to be the wrath of God coming down uh, and it will be ten times worse if you force me into that than if you if we have peace but you're not calling for America retreat from the world where you know you move to no I, I am not uh, an isolation policy uh, we do live in a global world now we are highly connected in travel we're highly connected technologically we do uh, rely on on other countries for different things and we contribute to other countries so that's that's uh, that's how we want to make America creative and innovative and prosperous again so I mean we've covered most of the topics and uh, I was just wondering like January 20th 2025 you've been elected president what do you do on the first day well, we have a few executive orders that uh, that need to be signed. Uh, we need to unwind a number of the policies that are hurting America today. Um, and then there are several things that uh, that we have. We have a list on our website of the executive orders that we plan to repeal day one and of the executive orders I plan to sign day one. So I would invite everyone to Which to, one, to which one will you sign first? Uh, repealing uh, the things that are hurting America today. Yeah, many of the policies that are hurting us, uh, foreign policy, uh, economically, uh, we will repeal those on day one. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you.